good evening ma'am today i would like to present uh, the case of a uh, 8 month old girl child hailing from bangalore informant being mother who was admitted in a hospital on 5th of this month and mother complained of abnormal movements of both upper and lower limbs noticed from from the past 2 months history of presenting illness mother noticed that the child started to develop sudden onset progressive episodes of abnormal movements noticed from 6 months of age mother described the movements to occur suddenly each movement lasting for 1 to 2 seconds used to occur multiple multiple number of times for around 2 to 3 minutes with around 10 to 15 seconds gap in between each movements initially it used to occur 2 to 3 times per day but gradually increased to 8 to 10 episodes per day mother described the movement to involve both the upper and lower limbs and uh, mother described that the baby used to uh, fold both the lower limbs and straighten both the upper limbs with opening up of the palms from in the past one month she has also noticed that there is associated flexion of the neck as well mother also tells that she could anticipate such an event before as the child used to become uncomfortable and used to make certain facial expressions following such event during the initial one month baby used to have inconsolable cry lasting for around 5 to 10 minutes but from last one month mother has noticed that following the event baby remains still and unresponsive to any of the stimuli given by mother though baby is awake for around 2 to 3 minutes no precipitating or relieving factors noticed by the parents such events never occurred during the time baby used to be asleep no issue of urinary or fecal incontinence frothing or i am not hearing anything uh, even i am not able to hear ashre some problem ma huh? i think some connectivity issue oh, just okay. okay let it become all right sorry mom for the net issue got disconnected now no. am i yes you are audible now uh screen is visible mom yes yes but so many ppts are seen. ah now it's very very clear uh um, mom from where was i not audible mom you can present no, this whole no, slide here only from this slide yes yes uh, okay so mother also tells that she could anticipate such event before as child used to become uncomfortable and used to make certain facial expressions following such event during the initial one month baby used to have inconsolable cry lasting around 5 to 10 minutes but from last one month mother has noticed that following the event baby remains still and unresponsive to any of the stimuli given by the mother though the baby is awake for around 2 to 3 minutes no precipitating or relieving factors noticed by the parents and such events never occurred during the time baby used to be asleep no issue of urinary or fecal incontinence frothing of saliva or loss of consciousness following such an event mother also complains 
of delay in development of her child as compared to others uh, she complains that the neck control was achieved late and only from past one week child has learned to roll over baby reaches out to objects with both hands laughs out aloud and has started to recognize the mother now but there is no history of any difficulty while wearing diapers noticed ma'am i also have the video of the event ma'am can i play ma'am yes ma'am we after you describe after you describe you have finished ah huh? uh i just copy i finish ma'am next i have the treatment uh, history no 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 before that you show the uh, display ah um. Um, this is the event now. So once more, ma'am. Okay. So we will try to go through the history, then we will go to the investigations. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So you Treatment told us. Is- yes, ma'am. Treatment will go to later. Uh, okay. Examination, you want to tell, no? Ill, no, ma'am. Treatment. The examination is, is there anything? Any neurocutaneous markers? Any microcephaly? Any dysmorphic features? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. So, so you can finish the history. After that, we will go to the uh, treatment and other things. Yes, ma'am. a uh, past history history of multiple visits in view of similar complaints from the past two months mm. family history no history of similar complaints in any of the other family members no history of any early childhood death in any of the other members this is the first born child to the parents and the it has been non consanguineous marriage mm. there is no antenatal natal or postnatal risk factors ma'am in the mm. child nutritional wise uh, baby used to suck on to the breast well ma'am so sucking movements were f- followed by swallowing movements i was and there was coordination between the movements and there was no drooling of any secretions as well noticed so baby used to feed well ma'am okay uh, immunization history is up to date developmental history gross motor wise the child is presently able to roll over fine motor bidextrous reach has been achieved by 6 months social smile is present and recognizes the mother baby coos and laughs out aloud vision child is able to fixate onto the objects and follows the object of interest hearing child is able to turn his head towards the side of the sound so there is gross predominantly gross motor development associated with other domains as well mm. uh summary a 8 month old girl baby born to non consanguineous married couple by normal vaginal delivery with no antenatal complications cried immediately after birth and no postnatal complications immunized up to date belonging to class 3 pupusami plant patient presented with complaints of abnormal movements that occurs in clusters from last 2 months with developmental le- delay with this would like to consider that child is suffering from a seizure disorder probably epileptic spasms or myoclonic jerks okay ma'am so first thing you have noticed as a pediatrician is a delay in the milestones in this child yes, no, for the yes. actual illness started yes ma'am yes ma'am so i am sure you know better than me still we can say that uh, at that point if the child has been brought to you that the child is not getting the actual development as per a requirement how yes. do you approach that developmental delay that is the question uh, would you like to answer that may be more informative still i can tell what we approach na no? mm. mm. tell me supposing okay. the person has been brought to you before okay. the movement disorder started what okay. kind of approach would you like to do the child has not attained head control till the age of 6 months uh, does the child develop social smile or not social smile child has developed ma'am okay so child has developed social smile uh, child yes. had not developed to focus smile i think was she uh, was she looking at the face and smiling at that time recognizing uh, just mother tells that only like from past few days it has started to look at the mother and recognize the okay. mother ma'am. so how do you categorize uh, a developmental delay let us forget about the movement disorder which came later 
Okay. So how do you categorize a global developmental delay in a child? So for us, I will tell, I am sure you should enlighten me. I, I am not a pediatrician. So from our point of view, okay. I will tell, there may be multiple, uh, uh, multiple types of approaches. And uh, what we do, I will tell you, you can tell us uh, the different approaches that are available. First, we say that whether it is a delay for the gray matter that we call polio dystrophy, is it for the white matter that is leukodystrophy, is it for both that is mixed dystrophy. So neurodevelopmental delay we categorize as polio dystrophy, leukodystrophy or mixed dystrophy. After having categorized the neurological into these three groups with dysmorphism, without dysmorphism, with neurocutaneous markers, without neurocutaneous markers, with systemic involvement, without systemic involvement. That is our approach. So whether it is a polio dystrophy, when the child will have only gray matter features, the gray matter features being cognitive delay. Child is not developing social smile. Child is not looking at the mother's face. Child is not developing stranger anxiety at an age when it should be attaining. So, and seizures. So, gray matter features will be lack of cognitive development for age. Like, as I said, social smile, focus smile, stranger anxiety, trying to follow light objects and uh, trying to recognize objects of uh, bright colored objects, toys and all those things and recognizing siblings by the age of about six months and all, then developing seizures and uh, retina. Retina goes with the gray matter. So gray matter features will be cognitive delay, seizures and retinal features like uh, retinal degeneration, RP, or you have got the you know, bullseye maculopathy. So all, the, uh, all these things come under gray matter. White matter will be motor delay, spasticity, or it may be flaccidity also. Even though it is LMN, uh, we group under uh, motor delay, mainly spasticity, under which you have got a large group of leukodystrophies. And uh, that also includes um, uh, uh, some amino acid areas like uh, arginine, arginase deficiency, they all present with leukodystrophy. Then uh, for convenience, we classify the element syndromes also because uh, there the cognition is normal. So compartmentalizing cognitive delay is one group and non-cognitive delay will be element and human. Human will be the spastic syndromes, that's a leukodystrophy. Element will be muscle and anterior function. And under the white matter, you have got motor delay uh, with increase in the tone and then they can have optic nerve. Optic nerve comes under leukodystrophy, white matter. Whereas retina comes under gray matter. So leuco will be spasticity, uh, motor delay, and uh, optic nerve. And uh, motor delay, element will be muscle anterior console. Then we have got mixed delay, both gray and white matter. Both gray and white matter, you have got uh, post-encephalitic sequelae, post-traumatic, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathies, neonatal hypoglycemic insult, plus if they are not static and if they are progressive, you have got the amino acidurias and neurometabolic disorders which involve both gray and white matter. So the, then you take the dysmorphic features. So dysmorphic features, each the, uh, eye abnormality, head circumference abnormality, abnormal uh, eyebrows, and year of normality, each one will point to a group of disorders. So you look at the specific dysmorphism that will be helping you so much to diagnose uh, a particular condition. You know, Magellan cephal is there in some conditions, microcephal is there in some conditions, big guys are there, corneal clouding, retinal changes, ear changes, mouth changes. So all these dysmorphic features you have to identify and uh, pick it up. After that, you look for systemic involvement, visceral involvement, heart involvement, liver involvement, spleen involvement, bone involvement. So involvement of the skeletal system, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, cardiac you know, So all these will help us to uh, categorize the condition in higher and higher order. Initially, is it neurodevelopment? 
then club it with other features if present or not present then look for specific neurocutaneous markers neurocutaneous markers you know that uh, you have got a lengitasia you can have you know, k fiole spot you can have white leafy macule subungual fibromas neurofibromas and uh, so all this will help you to categorize the cause for the global delay is it purely neural neural plus systemic or specific diagnostic dysmorphic features so now tell me how the pediatrician approach me. this is our approach uh, so i just want you to tell us there will be different methods <coughs> just brief us few points if you agree with my approach it is okay yes ma'am same ma'am it is the same but one more thing we would add on is in the history we will see whether where the uh, uh, insert was ma'am antenatal natal or postnatal ma'am so in the antenatal mm -hmm. period if there was any insert to the mother or any hypoxic damage like if mother had any seizure episodes or in the first time mister saw any of the torches infections that has led to the thing so mm -hmm. you certain or in or because of any antenatal uh, if there is any family history and consanguinity we can also think of any cranial malformations that has happened in the while the formation of the brain so that will be the antenatal then in the natal period during the time of delivery if any insult has occurred mm -hmm. like again birth asphyxia or a preterm or a term child so mm -hmm. preterm child can, could have gone into intraventricular hemorrhage and mm -hmm. that could have led to spastic uh, diplegia so mm -hmm. where the insult occurred during the natal period mom so whether the baby cried or not and whether it was a term gestation or a preterm gestation and if the baby has cried in the postnatal period if there was any significant nicu admission i mean one can be nicu admission because of the child being preterm and that preterm child because of the nicu state could have developed intraventricular hemorrhage or second it can be a term child hi child which has led to the periventricular leukomination or the damage or later on it the child might have if it has gone to an infant of diabetic mother which has caused hypoglycemia and this hypoglycemic insert could have led to the cause no? so these are the risk factors or any meningitis like neonatal sepsis that has gone and caused meningitis so mm. these are the natal risk factors we look for and then postnatally then we ask when the onset of this developmental delay was noticed if it has been noticed from the starting then we can think of static uh, disorders but if it was uh, noticed at some 3 months of age or then the child started to have regression then or 6 months of age the child developed properly then the th child started to have regression then we'll think of uh, neuro degenerative disorders mom okay this is history that of course is definitely important what uh, i told was uh, when the child, when you are examining the child so uh, this history is certainly important that uh, you have told also correctly and uh, that adds to the um, uh, causative factors but what i told is examination so uh, cognitive assessment of the child who is in front of you after you have taken the proper history so uh, this child apparently has got a cognitive delay because child has just started developing social smile i think so and um, uh, and uh, there is probably mild motor delay because the uh, head uh, control has come only now so apparently yeah. there is a predominantly cognitive delay and mild motor delay motor delay it looks yes. like that so till the age of 6 months and there was probably i think from your history no uh, prenatal intranatal or po immediate postnatal insult that has happened to this child apparently yes. from your history yes. so there is a global delay which is very moderate without probably much dysmorphic features or obvious neurocutaneous markers which the mother could identify so we will uh, look for what could be the cause of that so that indicates that there is some primary process which is premorbidly affecting the developmental speed of the child even though it is not halting it it is cre creating a relay so there is some abnormality in the neuro development that part is definitely there other clues which we thought will be helpful for etiological diagnosis is not there in this child after that you told that this child developed some involuntary movement which was associated with some warning features to the mother ah um, yes in the form of some irritability and uh, cry and things like that 
Yes. So now I want to ask one important question, which will be very useful for uh, most of us. If the child had been born with involuntary movements, when the child is being delivered, if the child, you told you will ask for prenatal, natal, uh, postnatal, that is very, very, very good. Uh, supposing this child was born with these involuntary movements, what you will think? What are the uh, situations? There are three important situations. I'm sure you know you can add on more. For us, we say a child is born with a seizure. Three things you have to think of. One, as you said, that it can be uh, in injury to the brain during delivery uh, due to either uh, a hemorrhage uh, due to a difficult delivery or hypoxia or it can be a compression injury to the brain or it can be an accidental injection of the uh, local anesthetic which is used for episiotin. So by child born convulsing, that is what I am telling. As the delivery is going on, the child is getting uh, convulsion means it can be a bleed either due to a difficult uh, negotiation of the baby in the pelvic structures or it could be due to accidental injection of the local anesthetic into the brain. Second, infant of diabetic mother. As you know, it is called fetal polynesia. The baby's islet cells are uh, hypertrophic to meet the infantal maternal hyperglycemia. When the placenta separates itself, the insulin becomes too much. So child will be born convulsing. So born convulsing, one accidental injection of the local anesthetic, second infant of diabetic mother, third and never forget it is pyridoxine dependent convulsions. Yes. Very, very important because many times the, the seizure can come after a long gap, it can give a long gap and then the child can develop seizures which will not respond to any anticonvulsion. And we <laughs> tend to give the diagnosis of uh, catastrophic epileptic encephalopathy syndromes. So they are global delay. They are not responding to any anticonvulsant. And you call them catastrophic epileptic encephalopathy. But only one history is wrong. Was the child having seizure at the time of birth? It may be there and later it may not be there. There is no specific type of seizure. It can be any type. And uh, only clue will be born convulsing. The bond convulsing three conditions which will help you at the bedside. Very, very useful because no anticonvulsant will help this condition. So this group of syndrome, this child is not fitting into because this was not there. Then you yes. told me that <coughs> this child's mother could send something. So what is the term that you for, use for that? When the child grows up, it may be more useful. I don't know. But I'm just asking because otherwise there is nothing. Yes. We will go straight into the case and finish it off. Before that, something which precedes the preictal events. Yes. So, what is the name for the preictal thing that happens in adults? Child aura. may not be Yes, aura. So, what do you mean by aura? Would you like to define aura? <coughs> aura. Oh. Would you like to define aura? Just like, uh, just to uh, keep the discussion, I am uh, saying all these things. Would you like to de uh, define aura? Oh, aura God. is that part of the seizure which gives the warning to the person for which awareness is retained. So in this child also awareness is retained. Child is crying. Yes. Something yes. is happening. Child is not in the usual um, sense. Um, but child is affected by that. So the child is crying. Adult yes. means they will communicate verbally. Child will only communicate by crying. So aura is defined as that part of the seizure for which awareness is retained. So person will not lose consciousness. It is more useful in adults. It helps us to categorize the seizures uh, uh, into localization related epilepsy. I don't know whether it is relevant in this child, but just I just ask that so that I will be able to tell you what is aura, what is automatism and what is a nictus. Okay. So aura is that part of the seizure for which awareness is retained and that helps you to retain, uh, helps you to localize. Epigastric aura, feeling of fear or feeling of goose flesh, feeling of autonomic features uh, or a visual aura. 
So all these things will tell you whether it is coming from the occipital lobe, whether it's coming from the insular region, whether it's coming from the temporal lobe. Uh, all those things you localize. Parietal lobe means goose flesh you'll get. Or you can have a uh, march you can get. Or if it is uh, occipital aura, you'll have uh, formed visual hallucinations, which are stereotype. Temporal lobe, you get epigastric aura, deja vu, jamai vu, fears, peculiar gyratory movements. So this one will point to the localization. What is automatism? Would you like so, to tell ma automatism? Ma'am, was there sensorium also? Aura sensorium will be retained. Yes, ma'am. Here sensorium ah. will be altered, ma'am, along with the... That's okay. I am just telling you uh, the definition. Your child is crying, no? Oh, crying means yes, sensory is there. Child is not stupor, child is not unconscious. Child is crying. So I'm not saying this is aura. Be careful. That's all. So that will help us at the end to make a prognostication of this child's problems. No? This is a prognostic relevance if there is an aura and a warning that the child is getting. So automatism would you like to define? Automatisms are uh, activities of the motor, activities of the patient in response to illusory internal or external stimuli for which awareness is not retained. Oh, yes, ma'am. Awareness, yes, ma'am. So it's automatisms, not... there is no awareness. And they are illusory motor activities of the patient in response to internal or external stimuli. So, supposing a person is having an automatism, patient may be searching in the floor and you call him, he will not respond. He will be searching under the cart or picking out his clothes, uh, removing the pillow, searching under the mattress. No? But the, you call him, he will not respond. That is illusory external stimuli. Or illusory internal stimuli is swallowing, chewing, retching. So they are illusory internal stimuli. And they are not responsive during that period. So automatisms are motor activity of the patient in response to illusory internal or external stimuli for which awareness is not retained. That is automatism. So you know, you know what is aura, what is automatism now? Now let yeah. us come to the type of movement the child is having. Uh, you said that the child has got a sudden extension of the lower limb and the child is opening the upper limb and occasionally the child's head is also getting flexed. Yes, ma'am. And it is bilateral symmetrical. Bilateral and symmetrical. Symmetrical. So you yes. have got a primary generalized movement. Yes, ma'am. Generalized movement. And this movement lasts only few seconds. Yes, ma'am. Few seconds. And uh, so it is symmetrical also, very quick. It yes, is, there is no twisting movements. No twisting movements. So this, if you want to call it as an involuntary movement, you will call it as a quick movement. It is not yes, a slow movement. Yes, ma'am. You have got a very quick movement. Whether the child is conscious during the movement or not, is there any eye signs? That is very important. You should tell whether the eye is going up in the movement. Or there was no uprolling of eyes, ma'am. The child used to be awake. Her, the child's eyes used to be open, ma'am. We asked whether the mother, whether there was uprolling of eyes noticed. There was no uprolling of eyes or deviation of eyes to any of the sides, ma'am. No uprolling, no side rolling, no nystagmus. No, no yes, yes ma'am. Nothing is there. So it is involving the limbs. Is the child aware during the attack? No. Aware the in the baby... Uh, like, for example, if the child is sucking, the sucking will stop. Okay, ma'am. So that kind uh, of thing... Whatever activity the child was doing, it used to stop, ma'am. When this... That means uh, the child is going into a brief loss of awareness. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so this uh, very quick movement. So under the quick movements, uh, we have got so many movements. So now we are not mentioning it as what? You are calling it as a movement. Because that is the way you have described. Mother described a movement. Because you are calling it as a movement, I am approaching it that way. So this is a very quick movement. So under yes. quick movements, you have got myoclonus. Yes, ma'am. Myoclonic. Yes, ma Ballistic movement. So next is the balism. Chorea. No, you have got Chorea. choreiform movements, which are quick movements. 
you have got ballistic movements which are quick movements and you have got myoclonus which are quick movements so would you like to define each one of them just for the discussion sake only i am asking so if it is a myoclonus we call it as a sudden shock yes ma'am so sudden shock like contraction which can uh, be focal segmental generalized with or without loss of consciousness and it can throw the person to the ground it can be a focal twitch or it can throw the person to the ground so myoclonus is a sudden shock like contraction which can be focal segmental or generalized with or without loss of consciousness it can either produce a focal twitch or it can throw the person to the ground so that is myoclonus supposing you take a hemi balismus so three quick movements are so it's a quick movement because it is happening within seconds there is not twisting there is not turning there is no posturing it is quickly coming and quickly going so it's a quick movement and uh, next quick movement is balism hemi balismus it is a violent swinging movement usually unilateral proximal more than distal and asymmetrical usually asymmetric so hemi balismus is a violent swinging movement proximal more than distal usually asymmetrical so this is a symmetrical very quick movement involving all four limbs and not fitting into the category of a violent swinging movement of hemi balismus next whether it will come under a chorea chorea is a quasi purposive non repetitive jerky distal movement so it is not a jerky distal movement it's a jerky movement which involves all four limbs as well as the head and leg so by this category we will put it under myoclonus myoclonus because it is a sudden shock like very brief movement involving all four limbs and it seems to involve the head and neck also so once you have decided this is myoclonus and not the other quick movements under myoclonus how are you going to categorize this so myoclonus may be epileptic myoclonus or non epileptic myoclonus yes it is also classified as cortical subcortical and spinal it may be focal segmental general so several classifications are there you can classify the myoclonus as epileptic myoclonus or non epileptic myoclonus cortical myoclonus subcortical myoclonus or spinal myoclonus or focal segmental and generalized myoclonus so these are various classifications so whenever your myoclonus is associated with loss of awareness briefly then it becomes an epileptic myoclonus if the myoclonus is not associated with loss of awareness it is non epileptic okay. so that is so this the child is unresponsive during the attack and stop sucking you said like that Yes, so ma'am. there is a loss of awareness so now we know in the among it's a quick movement among the quick movement it qualifies for a myoclonus and this myoclonus is associated with probably brief loss of awareness so it could be a epileptic myoclonus so that is how we approach this symptom i am sure you know this but i'm just telling you how to approach in another case which may not be that typical like this case next yes, i will tell you how to differentiate a cortical myoclonus from a subcortical myoclonus and a spinal myoclonus the cortical myoclonus for example cjd hmm? or you can get cortical myoclonus in cortico basal degeneration uh, so and even if all epileptic myoclonus are cortical myoclonus so one thing um, cortical myoclonus may be epileptic or non epileptic so cortical myoclonus are very quick focal generally quick they are generally focal they can be bilateral and there is stimulus sensitivity cortical myoclonus has got a stimulus sensitivity you tap the body part that uh, it will produce that jerk general it its own point so cortical myoclonus can be focal or generalized it is very very quick and it will have a stimulus sensitivity and the third uh, important point you do the eeg and you do the emg emg will pick up the myoclonus eeg will pick up the electrical discharge in cortical myoclonus eeg discharge will precede the emg discharge so first you will find the eeg discharge 
and the EMG discharge comes later. So that is cortical myoclonus. This typically seen in uh, degenerative diseases, prion diseases in adults. Then you come to the subcortical myoclonus, which is seen in your department, like SSP, subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis, post measles. No? That is yes. typically a subcortical myoclonus. So subcortical myoclonus is invariably bilateral. It is a slow myoclonus. You know, like that. They go slowly like that. It's not that much quick. It's a slow myoclonus. So subcortical myoclonus is a slow myoclonus. Cortical myoclonus can be focal or bilateral, whereas subcortical is generally bilateral. It is a slow myoclonus. And if you put the EEG and the EMG, the EMG will precede the EEG. Why? Because from the subcortex, the discharge goes to go to the cortex. Then only it is picked up. So the EMG will come first and the EEG follows. So that is, and you have got a classical, uh, uh, you have got a periodic reflex, periodic discharge in the EEG, uh, which will have a, a definite frequency, periodically recurring, uh, slow discharges will be there uh, in the EEG. But how to categorize it is subcortical myoclonus is the myoclonic discharge will precede the EEG discharge. So it is slow, it is bilateral, and the EMG will precede the EEG, that is subcortical. Then you have got the spinal myoclonus. Spinal myoclonus usually happens in some ganglionitis, transverse myelitis due to viral ganglionitis. So it will be at the segment where there is a myelopathy. Suppose you have got D4 myelopathy. At the top level, you may have a segmental twitching. So that is one kind of spinal myoclonus. Another proprio-spinal myoclonus, suppose it is sometimes seen in uh, HIV myelopathy. So HIV myelopathy patients, they have a myoclonus of the trunk that will bend their trunk. That's called proprio-spinal myoclonus. So it's a slow myoclonus. Uh, it can bend the trunk or it can be with the spinal ganglionitis where in that segment where the viral infection has happened, there is a quick twitching. So that is cortical, subcortical and uh, spinal. Then based on the geographic distribution, it can be a focal jerk, it can be a segmental myoclonus or it can be a generalized myoclonus. Generalized. So this child seems to have a generalized uh, myoclonus with involvement of the uh, awareness. So it looks like an epileptic myoclonus. And you told me that the eye signs were not there. Are you surprised, ma'am? Eye signs were supposed to be there, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You should not be surprised because this can be an MCQ question. As you know, okay. most of the seizures, most of the seizures uh, will have some eye signs. All kinds of seizures have eye signs. And there are very few seizures which do not produce eye signs. That gives a very important diagnostic clue. Under that, you have got the West syndrome. You see, the West okay. syndrome is one seizure, which even though it involves the head and the limbs, it does not involve the eye. Then you have got epilepsy or partial is continual. The, you see, local continuous focal seizures. Hmm. Uh, okay, so the epilepsy or partial is continual can involve only one upper limb. It can involve only one lower limb. And that does not produce eye signs. So seizures which do not pick up the eye in any way, either uprolling, side rolling, nystagmus, opsoclonus, something will be there. So uh, or, strange, st or sudden stare. So nothing is there means uh, it, uh, one important uh, clue, it, it, it may be a West syndrome. So okay. West syndrome is one seizure where there is no eye signs. And epilepsy or partial is continuous, another group of seizures where there are no eye signs. Otherwise, most of the seizures involve the eyes. So you eyes. are not surprised. It's a generalized myoclonus in a child who is eight months old with mild global delay. And uh, so this might call, qualify for a uh, probably a West syndrome. West syndrome. So in this situation, you have to ask um, uh, what is the importance of that premonition that you got, whether it is really true. If some premonition is there, and the West syndrome may have a uh, structural abnormality. So West syndrome can have 
no demonstrable structural abnormality or uh, sometimes it can have demonstrable structural abnormality structural. that yes. ultimately determines the outcome of the condition right. so at this uh, situation would you like to tell me sometimes no children it is very very difficult to know what is the involuntary movement children have so many benign movements so would you yes, like to consider the benign myoclonus which happens in children um benign myoclonus happens usually during the sleep um this child was always awake mom very good mm, second yes, that is one pointer towards uh, not uh, being the benign myoclonus mom Agreed. and over here there is even a, a developmental delay and cognition involvement mom. very good In benign so myoclonus one point you told very correct there is a primo preceding developmental delay that yes, will be never seen in a benign myoclonus second the benign myoclonus happens generally in sleep that is also yes. very much uh, correct third yes. point uh, third, third point benign myoclonus starts earlier mom hmm. very good so usually it is seen in the seen in the immediate neonatal period neonatal period and yes. it uh, tends to disappear by about the third month whereas yes, the child symptom has started much later and fourth yes, important point the activity if the child is sucking and sleeping the sucking will go on yes so none correct. of the activities will stop so benign myoclonus very correctly you told it starts very early and usually tend to wane off by itself by the age of 3 or 4 and it is usually seen in sleep and if any activity is going on that activity will continue and there is no uh, developmental delay at all so these four points very very important because many times we should not treat a normal child also i am sure my and eeg will be normal and eeg will, uh, yes. will be normal and many times because the uh, pediatric eeg is unless you really know the pediatric patterns you have got so many um, patterns uh, where you get a periodic um, discharges uh, which are called uh, pal uh, periodic alternating discharges can be seen in the newborn child they are not indicative of epilepsy so unless you know the uh, variability in the eeg pattern in the child you can report seizures the person who reports seizure is he really aware of what is reporting no uh, yes, so, so many syn synchronous discharges can be seen in the child and mostly you are going to take a sleep eeg and all the more it will not give any information no So yes, you can end up treating a myoclonus in an apprehensive parent with multiple anticonvulsants, and that may lead on to global <coughs> developmental delay in the child. So very important to know benign myoclonus. So it is very unlikely to be benign myoclonus of the child. So would you like to tell me the other myoclonic? So now we know this child has got a myoclonus. The myoclonus in this age group can be Dravet's. Uh, yes. So, would you like syndrome. to consider Dravet syndrome? What are all the points in but Dravet syndrome? What are all the points? Along with myoclonic seizures, they'll have other uh, types of uh, seizures also. Yes. Any other point, ma? Any other point? Dravet. And so it will be more severe. Hmm. It will be Tell more me. severe, ma'am, as compared to this child. Dravet oh. syndrome children. Yes. anything else mom anything generally the most important point in this child usually dravet is asymptomatic before the age of 1 year ha ah, yes mom they present later ha ah. they come later so this child is only 8 months and generally the parents say the child was absolutely normal apparently child is normal till the age of 1 year so there is not much uh, global delay or anything noticed second as vijay has put <coughs> prolonged febrile seizures a typical febrile seizures like prolonged febrile seizures so are common so dravet syndrome usually manifest after the age of 1 year and they can have prolonged febrile seizure and as you rightly said it not necessarily myoclonic they can have focal seizures they can have generalized seizures and they can have myoclonic seizures this combination and they go into a refractory course deteriorate very badly so those are the features so after the age of 1 year prolonged febrile seizures which qualify for a typical febrile seizures can be focal generalized and myoclonic with uh, rapid uh, decline and they are generally refractory to 
multiple anti convulsant they may respond to ketogenic diet so this child is not going to be dravet because the child is much younger child yes, is, uh, not in that age group and there is some kind of delay which is not unco- not common in dravet and there are no febrile seizure so at this point we will utilize this opportunity to describe what is a febrile seizure would you like to describe more? define so febrile seizure benign and atypical that is also very important for us to know as yes, pediatrician com. would you like to tell me more febrile seizure uh, the seizure it is a type of seizure that occurs uh, with the onset it is a fever provoked seizure ma'am yes and no uh, previously in a healthy child with the fever provoked seizure uh, that occurs uh, in if it is a typical seizure it occurs usually within 24 hours which lasts for less than 5 minutes ma'am if it is an atypical seizure the seizure can occur even after 24 hours and even if it occurs within 24 hours there can be multiple episodes or each episodes can last more than 5 uh, minutes ma'am so that will be a feature of an atypical febrile seizure ma'am very good ma'am so if you want to define it's very important because you people only should decide all these things it's a benign febrile seizure is defined as pathological thermal sensitivity of a pathological thermal sensitivity of a normally developing brain which generally has got a uh, t- dominant course usually one of the parent father or mother so it is a pathological thermal sensitivity of a normally developing brain the brain as such is normal only but it is responding to you know any prop- any neuron will convulse when you insult the main property of the neuron is to jump when irritated because it fires so it depend we call it as a seizures if the threshold is low and uh, anybody any one of us will convulse if you have a cerebral hemorrhage if you have a massive head injury so convulse is the property of the neuron so it is low thermal sensitivity that's all so uh, benign febrile seizures are dominantly inherited you know that father had febrile seizure or mother had So it's a pathological thermal sensitivity of a normally developing brain, which runs in families. As you said, it happens between six months to six years. Six years. It, yes. It will, if it comes before the age of six months, you should be careful. And if it comes beyond the age of six years also, you should be careful. So pathological thermal sensitivity of a normally developing brain, which has got a dominant course, which may not be always present and between 6 months to 6 years and not and as a result of uh, any cns infection or metabolic uh, that's what i said it is a normally developing brain that's a okay. definition so yes, definition sir. means you use the exact words so the exact words for the definition is pathological thermal sensitivity of a normally developing brain that means you are not thinking of any meningitis or any insult that is a normally yes. developing brain has a dominant course between 6 months to 6 years that is the complete definition pathological thermal sensitivity of a normally developing brain that covers excludes all infections metabolic all insults is a normally developing brain and has a dominant pattern of inheritance most of the time between 6 months to 6 years and as you said the pre- uh, presentation will be it happens in the peak of the fever and usually it is one single seizure in one febrile illness clustered seizures in one febrile illness is most likely a typical and when the seizure happens when the fever is subsiding or fever is very less that is also you have to be careful so peak of the fever single seizure very brief indirectly eeg normal so during the ictus the eeg may be abnormal but indirectly eeg should be normal and uh, so usually uh, there are not more than 3 to 4 attacks uh, before the age of 6 years yes ma'am so single seizure in the peak the duration of the seizure is uh, not qualifying for a <coughs> prolonged seizure it lasts for 3 to 5 minutes and it will not be a clustered seizure and eeg in the interrectal phase will be normal that's a benign no. seizure supposing the neurodevelopment is abnormal supposing it is a focal seizure 
it is not happening in the peak of the fever. More than one seizure during one febrile illness and, uh, and indirect EEG is abnormal. This quali uh, qualifies for a atypical febrile seizure. Yes. Yes. Uh, so this child uh, does not qualify for a uh, Dravet syndrome. So any other condition, you so it's not a benign myoclonus. It is not a Dravet syndrome. Uh, would you like to consider other conditions uh, which can like uh, uh, generalize epilepsy of associated with fevers, no? Myoclonic yes. gastric epilepsy, Lennox gastrot syndrome. Lennox These are the different conditions you have to consider in this age group, no? Yes, ma'am. So would you like to uh, tell me what will be the feature of a fever associated seizures? Which fever. are not the benign no. febrile seizures. Fever associated seizures, which are not benign means that they can be classified as febrile seizure plus mom. They yes. Yes. have a background of uh, epileptic activity and it gets provoked by febrile seizure. So it mom. will be a generalized seizure provoked yes. by fever it and it will have an indirect EEG abnormality. Yes, Whether you should really use the term benign is a a question uh, because uh, most of them have got uh, some sequelae. Uh, yes. The thing is uh, to differentiate from the other seizures, it is generally generalized seizure and not a myoclonic seizure. Yes. It can sometimes progress to myoclonic seizure during follow up, but at the onset, they are fever associated generalized seizures. They have abnormal EEG. And later in the course of illness, some of them progress to myoclonic seizures. So that is the category of that. Then uh, what about uh, lennox gastrot syndrome? lennox gastrot syndrome, again, age group, ma'am, they present later. Initially, yes. they come either with like infantile spasms like our yes. case or they can start yes. as febrile seizure, complex febrile seizure who later on go on to develop lennox gastrot syndrome. So as you said, some of them can start as West syndrome and later progress to lennox gastrot. Or yes. they can start late only. Uh, that is point number one. Second point. What is the second point, ma'am? Ma'am, again, lennox gastrot syndrome has multiple types of... Uh, Very good. So they will have multiple seizure types of which yes. what is the most important one, ma'am? Electronic seizures. Huh? They can have focal seizures, they can have generalized seizures, they can have most important is atonic because supposing some child comes with multiple bumps in the head, that is Lennox Gestalt syndrome. They will have multiple bumps because of the atonic seizures, which are so pathetic to watch. When they suddenly hit their head, multiple bumps. It is so pathetic we used to. I used to feel like crying. Why this much head injuries uh, God is giving to this child? They will have multiple uh, healed organizing hematomas in the scalp. So supposing a child with cognitive decline comes with multiple bumps, you don't have to ask history. It is yeah, not And the EEG will have typical features. Uh, it will help us to differentiate from other myoclonic seizures even if the history is not proper. So EEG will have a slow spike and wave syndrome. Whereas a uh, wave syndrome will be usually hypsarrhythmia. Uh, you know what is hypsarrhythmia? Uh, yes, ma'am. Either chaotic uh, EEG pattern. There will be high voltage, slow wave followed by spikes, ma'am. Very good, ma'am. So what you have to tell, hypsarrhythmia is conjugate. Conjugate yes, means symmetric. Uh, yes, that is what conjugate. So yes, conjugate, it is bilateral. So hip surgery means conjugate, chaotic, because it is not having a periodic pattern. Unlike the other slow myoclonus and other things which have got a periodic pattern, it will not be there. So it is conjugate, that means bilateral. It is chaotic, that means it is not having a periodic pattern. So conjugate, chaotic, high voltage, very high voltage, more than 50 microvolts. So conjugate, chaotic, high voltage, slow waves. So it is not the classical poly spike and waves which you see in myoclonus. It is a conjugate, chaotic, high voltage, very high voltage slowing with burst suppression. Burst yes. suppression means 
that high voltage discharge consumes so much energy that after that the eeg goes into silence the brain becomes very silent with very little activity for some time and then that you told this child also after some time goes into the, some kind of inactive phase that time maybe the child has got a hypsarrhythmic eeg i don't know so conjugate chaotic high voltage slowing with burst suppression with focal and multifocal spikes polyspikes and sharp so it is conjugate chaotic high voltage slowing with burst suppression with focal and multifocal uh, spikes and spike and wave discharge so that is hypsarrhythmia whereas lenox gestalt is multiple seizure types later age group there may be history of myoclonic seizures in uh, early infancy and they have uh, multiple bumps in their head because of the atonic attacks so that is lenox gestalt because it's all important for you to prognosticate the treatment options to be discussed with the parents next yes. group under this is myoclonic estatic seizures so myoclonic estatic seizures come little more later not in the 7 months to 1 year age group they will have myoclonic seizures plus drop attacks drop attacks yes so these are the conditions then never forget the pyridoxine dependent convulsions other metabolic convulsions in this age group pyridoxine dependent convulsions i am very uh, particular you should remember because many times if you do not think about it you forget it and uh, we have seen uh, people who go from uh, pillar to post with the fashionable diagnosis what uh, under that is the catastrophic epileptic encephalopathy with the common thing here they do not have any milestone only thing they runs in families born convulsing is one clue seizure type or eeg pattern is not characteristic so seizure type can be anything it can be generalized seizure it can be myoclonic seizure it can be focal seizure and eeg pattern also is not at all specific but born convulsing more than one member if it is there and it is not responsive to any treatment you can simply do of course you have got complex sophisticated investigatory tools are there but simple thing which any one of us can do is you do a which one ma yes, you told something no we start if they are not responding we try to start with pyridoxine supplement from oral that is true but yes, what i am telling to confirm you can simply do an eeg normally where i told that there is no characteristic pattern unique unlike the west syndrome or unlike the lenox gestalt or unlike the uh, other given syndrome all those things which come under this uh, but if you give neurobion the eeg discharge will subside upside that uh, neurobion is there everywhere no so we yes. tell pyridoxine but as such pyridoxine is not available parenteral pyridoxine is not available only oral pyridoxine is oral. available so uh, how do you give we give the neurobion only neurobion contains b1 b6 b12 no that b6 b6 part can be used and we can give up to 100 mg but just like when you give diacepam there can be respiratory arrest in other seizures when you give intravenous pyridoxine in pyridoxine dependent seizures they can have respiratory arrest so it's an anti convulsant effect with a small risk of respiratory arrest but you will see beautiful normalization of the eeg then you don't have to do genetics or anything you can withdraw all the anti convulsants slowly and increase the dose of uh, pyridoxine to 30 mg per kg body weight the importance is it is uh, likely to recur and subsequent pregnancy prenatally itself you start high dose pyridoxine to the mother the baby will be normal all uh, so it is of importance in preventing subsequent children who may have the genotype uh, it is likely it runs in families more than one child generally gets affected even if you are unable to afford the uh, genetic test this test itself is confirmatory giving intravenous pyridoxine but be careful whether the child goes into respiratory arrest you should be able to resuscitate so that subsequent babies prenatally you can give prenatal diagnosis is possible 
and even if you are not diagnosed you can give pyridoxin and then in the postnatal period continue that and then evaluate the child and you can withdraw if it is not indicated so that we should not forget at all then uh, any other condition you want to consider so this is a myoclonic epilepsy uh, considering the age of onset uh, it looks like a classical west, west syndrome. syndrome so yes, it's a west syndrome uh, idiopathic symptomatic or cryptogenic that is the question you have asked yes. because that is going to be your prognostic okay. so now you uh, examine you examine and tell me what you found Uh, examination, general examination, vitals were stable, ma'am. Anthropometry wise, head circumference was less than minus one standard deviation. Ma'am. Forty-one yes. centimeter, the child had. Uh, yes. Head to toe examination, there was no dysmorphic features, ma'am. Only thing that was noticed was pa the pale pallor was present along with hyperpigmented uh, knuckles uh, were noticed. There were no neurocutaneous markers or any facial dysmorphism dysmorph was noticed. Mm -hmm. Uh, head to toe. Child was anemic. Yeah? Was the child uh, anemic? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma child was anemic. Okay. Uh, head to toe examination, uh, cranial nose, uh, sorry, central nervous system examination, higher mental function, baby is conscious, active, looks and uh, looks at the mother, interacts. Uh, cranial nose examination was normal. Motor examination, uh, normal flexure posture was present. Tone was normal in all four limbs. Muscles were feel, uh, firm to feel. And power was more than three by five in all the four limbs. Uh, reflexes were, uh, except for plantar, which we can't comment about now, even though it is extensor reflex. Other reflexes were normal, ma'am. Okay. Uh, there were no other uh, signs uh, pointing towards uh, CNS uh, examination, any abnormality, ma'am. Other systemic examination, uh, even in parabdamen, there was no hepatomegaly or splenomegaly noticed, ma'am. So that. Uh, Systemic involvement is not there. Systemic involvement was not there, ma'am. Okay. Next on the investigations. Okay. Investigation. So, total count is slightly less, huh? Is it okay for the child? Uh, 4,000 we take on. Total count was little less. MCB was slightly on the higher side, ma'am. Okay. And B12 levels were low for the child, mom. Vitamin D levels were normal. Electrolyte imbalance was not there. Uh, B12 levels were lower for the age, and homocysteine levels as well was increased uh, for the age, mom. Okay. Uh, peripheral smear showed dimorphic anemia with few hypersegmented neutrophils, and again, neurometabolic workup like ABG, ammonia, lactate, uh, urine, urine for reducing substances, there no abnormality was detected in. In that mom, and EEG showed uh, um, I was not able to read the EEG, but the reporting of the EEG showed. Uh, Show the EEG, mom. Yeah. Okay, you go back to the EEG. Okay, so only one page is there, huh? Uh, so why here? What you are seeing is three pages. Uh, this page, okay, on uh, this page, let us see. So what That's you are finding? You find a. Uh, High voltage slowing. High voltage slowing discharges are coming recurrently. And yes, after, after this discharge, there is less than 50% reduction of the pre-morbid amplitude. If it is there, you can call it as a burst suppression. But sometimes you find severe suppression. So there is definitely, uh, compared to the uh, previous discharge, there is suppression of the background. And uh, you find some sharp waves, sharp slick. So it is not chaotic. The chaotic background is not there, but you are finding recurrent high voltage discharges followed by suppression of the background. Go to the next page, ma. Let me. See. So here you are finding uh, again sharp waves are there, slow waves are there, and uh, okay, this page is not showing much, but the previous page shows. High voltage recurrent discharges uh, with uh, burst suppression. Not a classical hypsarrhythmia. Classical yes. hypsarrhythmia will be more chaotic. Yes. Uh, more, very chaotic it will be. But uh, here the background is posterior dominant, multifocal spike, short pace, microorganism, movement artifice, 40 stimulation, 
the abnormal eg modified yes it's not a typical hypsarthmy typical hypsarthmia will be very very chaotic very very chaotic and there will be severe birth suppression birth suppression will almost be silent like that is not there high voltage flowing is there so it can be called mod, uh, a typical hypsarthmia okay then um, what other things b12 low so yes, b12 was uh, like low to consider hyper homocysteinuria in this case ma what uh, there is another condition no? there is a condition yes, called hyper homocysteinemia what yes, are the manifestations of that would be because there is something whether it is a dual pathology accidental coincidence or is it causally related that is the next question hyper homocysteinemia deficiency also can present with uh, like global developmental delay can be there yes seizures yes. can occur hypotonia yes. can occur ma'am so these are the few features with b12 deficiency producing neurological uh, manifestations ma'am with the cognitive delay ma'am so hyper homocysteinemia in a child is slightly uh, uh, different as he said uh, uh, it will produce alopecia okay ma'am a child like biotin deficiency biotinidase deficiency mm -hmm. or hyper homocysteinuria these are conditions where there is alopecia so child will alopecia biotinidase and hyper homocysteinuria they will have ichthyosis they have ichthyosis and they are spastic they are delayed and they can have seizures but Uh, important clue is uh, ichthyosis, spasticity, and uh, alopecia. Okay. They have uh, less hair. They are spastic. They have ichthyosis. They are delayed, and they can have seizures. But this is not at all fitting into the classical manifestation of a hyperhomocysteinemia. So it may be incidental. I think yes. it may be incidental. Okay. Next may not be causally related. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Next, ma'am. Let's show the This MRI. Was the MRI brain, ma'am? Okay. Let us see the MRI. So, let me see. So, apparently, the MRI, the gyral pattern. I am not seeing any macrogyria, microgyria, or any migration disorder. I am not seeing. and uh, let me see uh, the whole thing myelination should be posterior anterior apparently i think that uh, for a 7 months old child i cannot say it is abnormal i feel the brain stem is okay and uh, basal ganglia structures are not showing anything to suspect uh, lee syndrome or mitochondrial encephalopathy is where you find um, uh, symmetrical Uh, basal ganglia changes will be changes. most of the metabolic syndromes including lee syndrome which can present with seizures also so i am not seeing any of those so apparently it looks like a normal brain for age in this child here uh, if you are very uh, suspicious person i am not uh, agreeing with that but uh, slightly increased csf in front of the um, temporal lobe but it is okay for this child what condition you get increased csf space in front of the temporal lobe bilaterally as a pediatrician not this child i think this is only 8 months old child this much space is okay no but supposing you find increased very much increased subdural space in this area in a child who is convulsing and globally delayed what is that called imagine this is a csf And this Spice is and which one? It's called bat wing appearance. You heard a bat wing appearance. Motoric aciduria. This is not okay. classical bat wing. Some little increase in the subdural space is there. That is okay for this eight months old child. But supposing okay. this CSF is little more, Fine. and this temporal lobe is the wing, and this is the body. Does it not look like a bat wing? Yes. Yes. Ma yes. But for that bat wing, this space will be little more. The subdural space there is a, a quantitative assessment of the subdural space, which is for age. So this is okay. Increase subdural space is slightly increase the subdural space is common in children and very old people. 
because in the child the brain is developing in the in the adult the brain is atrophy so it slightly increase subdural space is common but there is a proportion between the temporal lobe volume and the subdural space for which a formula is there so if this subdural space is very much increased and this is the body of the bat this is the wing of the bat that is called bat wing brain i just thought i will tell you that that is diagnostic of glutaric yes, sir. okay not this one next one how do we comment about myelination mom looking at the you see a uh, posterior anterior and inferior uh, inferior superior so from the occipital region the myelination will start then the okay. uh, white matter signal changes you have to look at in the normal if you see the you see the uh, this white matter signal changes will be normally starting posteriorly uh, in the this is a t1 weighted image the t1 weighted image the white matter will uh, look a little more uh, white than the gray matter so that part is okay it is uh, showing that a normal gray white contrast is seen in the posterior part so it starts posteriorly and progresses anteriorly so that gray white contrast is maintained for 7 months old so that is how you look at that the gray white contrast is very well appreciated here and it will start in the brain stem so you go to the brain stem let us see so in the brain stem also you are able to see the uh, hyper intensities the signal changes are well seen in the brain stem so below upper and posterior anterior gray white contrast becoming uh, appreciable that indicates myelination so if it is not appreciable it looks like an ironed out brain then it is not myelin it's only 7 months so for that it's okay that but there are some regions the splenium there are definite uh, uh, calibration but apparently this is okay there are uh, tabulation by which uh, which part of the splenium which part of the occipital white matter how much is the quantification like i told the uh, pre temporal white matter there is an index so for like that there is an index that you let apply if you are doing a, a real study but grossly look that contrast you are able to see that's all you are able to appreciate the contrast so i think it's okay posterior anterior and inferior superior so like that we say but there is a quantification that if you are very seriously looking for you to apply that calibration and find out splenium how much how much in the white matter on the occipital region like that some uh calibration is there that i cannot tell off and you will have to uh, take that formula and apply in the image that can be applied and it can be quantified okay 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 final diagnosis we thought of was cryptogenic west syndrome with moderate anemia secondary to vitamin b12 deficiency okay yes that anemia so it's a dual pathology why did you say cryptogenic vitreli i agree with you because there was no uh, other no, not situation. able to demonstrate anything in yes, the imaging yes, but yes, there is a global delay that indicates probably something is wrong yes ma'am so before the onset of the uh, classical myoclonic seizures if there was nothing that you could find then you may say it is idiopathic so there may be something hiding why why is it important to call it as cryptogenic in this child we can prognosticate yes. the so you have got a prognosis for future development so when you say cryptogenic you are not you are going to give a guarded prognosis so the child may be handicapped for future because there had been preceding delay there may be a cyto architectonic abnormality which you are not able to demonstrate with the available tool that is what you mean when you say cryptogenic that yes. is going to give a guarded prognosis for the future cognitive development of the child okay, okay. then uh, what are the treatment options ma when you have a hypsarrhythmia what are all the treatment options treatment options ma'am uh, uh, when this particular child ma'am since the child has been having the features from past two months it was taken to multiple clinics ma'am so okay. initially when it, first time when it was taken to a uh, private hospital after one month of such an event the child was started on valproate syrup and okay. along with pyridoxine supplements ma'am mother noticed that after taking this syrup number of such episodes decreased to four to times five times per day but it not completely subside 
then one month later baby it was taken to nimans and certain blood investigation and urine investigations were done mri and eeg was done following this additional levetiracetam syrup as well was started along with the existing valproate but after that also since four to five such episodes were there the child was taken to our hospital then we sought a neurologist opinion who told it is a type of modified hip arrhythmia variant and we started the child on steroids from prednisolone we started at 4 mg per kg per day mm. after starting prednisolone 2 to 3 days after starting the prednisolone the child stopped having completely such episodes mom now right. and we started on b12 injections as well now after the for completing prednisolone two weeks of starting the child had come for follow up today also mom so the child is not having any further investigations and we have asked the child to get repeat eeg done mom so if on doing repeat eeg if the child has completely subsided and we start tapering steroids on steroids if it doesn't get control then we start on vigabatrin again mm. we give a trial for two weeks still if it doesn't subside we start on acth form so when there is a hip arrhythmia so hip arrhythmic eeg is the clue that is one thing valproate should not be started in children below the age of 9 months because the hepatic maturation is not there and they can develop rice syndrome and other complications so valproate is not at all safe in children below the age of 9 months so it is only oh, yes. so that is very dangerous and that to high dose valproate 40 mg per kg uh, should not be given for unless you have no other option nothing is working the situation you may give but valproate is uh, ideally not used in children below the age of 9 months they are more prone for rice syndrome uh second they can be mitochondrial disorders they will go into fatal complication they will die because murph that also present with the myoclonic epilepsy or encephalopathy uh, lee syndromes they all uh, will you give one dose of alprate they will they can develop encephalopathy myoglobinuria all those possibilities is there so it should not be given and when you see hip arrhythmia that is an ideal indication for acth ACTH being a parenteral one and a very costly one, you costly. can supplement with the oral steroid. But if the child is responding, it is very very good. Next uh, two things: one, this syndrome, vigabatrim and ACTH, with or without ketogenic diet. Yes, ma'am. That is the uh, uh, ideal thing. So good. Uh, it's a. It looks like a classical case, typical case, the age group. fitting into the classical west syndrome so you can call it as a west syndrome classical west syndrome and hip arrhythmia is the clue that it will respond to steroids or acth yeah. we of course try in any refractory seizure steroids are tried but ideally hip arrhythmic eeg and a myoclonic seizure that's an indication to start acth and as a substitute you can give steroid next will be vigabatrim and ketogenic diet so good good mom okay. i just asked more questions uh to keep the thing to an hour yeah, it was a learning process for us as well mom mom uh, what happens like in this child if the eeg is uh, changes subside with oral prednisolone now we start tapering the steroids over 3 to 4 weeks so what are the further chances of child getting supplement with the alternative anti convulsant and there had been a preceding delay and you are you are thinking uh, generally what happens usually after 3 months period because of the serious side effects of steroids or acth we tend to withdraw but okay. and supplement with vigabatrin mostly they are maintained with vigabatrin and as you know vigabatrin also has got a uh, optic toxicity so you yes, have to be uh, monitor the vision and most of these children whom we are thinking are cryptogenic they don't stop there classical idiopathic means some of them go into arrest of further seizures and later during uh, developmental age like uh, uh, pubertal age they may go into other types of seizures in between they can have long remission so idiopathic classical west syndrome good number of people can later go into remission then uh, get another mo- other modified seizures during pubertal age group whereas cryptogenic they like previous delay <coughs> those children uh, even if the eeg uh, becomes much better when you withdraw the steroids they definitely do not <coughs> keep without seizures 
you have to maintain them with vigor battery that's the ideal one and uh, observe the uh, vision and uh, if there is any visual compromise you will have to do trial and error with other anti convulsants okay ma'am like this child now is she it was already on valproate and levetiracetamol so we stopped both so should we have continued with levetiracetam ma'am then no, levit with... uh, levetiracetam and the role in west syndrome is not very clear okay vega battery if they can afford another indian company has come now i think okay. uh, because you don't want the child to have more seizures and female child no more the so mental retardation we don't want uh, you can start the child on vega battery uh, previously okay. sabril it was a monopoly now one indian company has come vp or something like that it is there you can uh, regularly watch the vision i have not seen much uh, many patients developing visual compromise only thing once in 3 months you will have to do the visual assessment visual assessment okay. better to start a drug which will uh, which is specifically indicated so that the child does not get more attacks and more delay vega battery mm -hmm. is the ideal one so the child should be continued on long term vega battery generally at least 2 years okay fine understood any other question ma'am when you are thinking cryptogenic is a possibility the okay. long term course becomes unpredictable you know that in the natural history of seizures about uh, 30% of the people are curable that means after a 2 to 4 year seizure free interval you may be able to withdraw the seizures that is only 30% another 30% become drug dependent and another 30% in spite of drugs they can get breakthrough seizures on and off but that will be ideal drug you should choose the drug you know some of the anti convulsants are epileptogenic for example eptoin is epileptogenic in myoclonic seizures valproate is epileptogenic in mitochondrial disorders with seizures phenobarbitone is epileptogenic in mitochondrial disorders with seizures so like that so you should avoid you should choose the drug of choice so generally seizures you have group of drugs which are choice drugs and uh, absent seizures you have got drug of choice focal seizure so you should categorize the seizure type choose the appropriate drug give it in adequate dose and when you uh, think that the first drug is not helping you can add the second drug but the third drug fourth drug you should not keep on adding you should find out which drug did not help whatever did not help should be withdrawn because adding three drug four drug increases the toxicity with very little benefit so some children i have seen children adult everybody all the invented anti convulsants will be there that and all we, we should not do that means you are not respecting those people who invented these drugs they did hard work to help mankind we should not insult them so which one did not help always withdraw first is type the seizure choose the drug of choice titrate to maximum tolerated dose avoid all precipitating factors like starvation sleep deprivation stress light sensitivity so many precipitating factors will be there in each individual remove all of them then uh, you maximum two drug more than that you should be very cautious and some of them become so 30% become drug dependent without drug they cannot be maintained another 30% in spite of ideal drug in the optimum dose they still continue to get breakthrough seizures and they may be candidates to be investigated for uh, surgery epilepsy and other alternative methods of treatment like vagal stimulation and other all those things then 10% of the persons <coughs> are refractory in spite of anything so that is the natural cause that only 30% get cured especially the myoclonic seizures are all overall prognosis is bad that one of the worst kind of seizures especially when you think they are cryptomatic cryptogenic or symptomatic they are the worst group so myoclonic assets is bad when they are symptomatic they are all the more bad so we have to be guarded we cannot reassure the parents that the child is going to be normal <coughs> we have to be very careful